Welcome to Permission to Shift, where each week you get to hear from experts that will help you remove limits, transform fear, and create a life you're excited to live. This week's guest is Dr. Robert Maurer. Dr. Maurer is the Director of Behavioral Sciences for the Family Practice Residency Program in Spokane, Washington, and a faculty member of the UCLA School of Medicine and the University of Washington School of Medicine. He's a clinical psychologist, deeply studying the skills necessary to achieve and sustain excellence in health, relationships, and work. Dr. Marr travels extensively, presenting seminars and consulting to diverse organizations, such as corporations, hospital staff, universities, theater companies, spas, and even the British government and the U.S. Navy. He served as a consultant to Walt Disney Studios, the U.S. Air Force, Habitat for Humanity, Make-A-Wish, Bank of America, and BP, to name a few. Dr. Marr has won the Navy's Civilian Award for his course on negotiation skills. Dr. Marr's previous books include One Small Step Can Change Your Life, published in 20 languages, and The Spirit of Kaizen. His most recent book is now also available. It's called Mastering Fear. Dr. Marr has appeared on and been featured in ABC TV's 2020, USA Today, and the Los Angeles Times. It is with great pleasure that I welcome him to our show today. Dr. Maurer focuses on simple steps that can really change your life. And uh, Dr. Maurer, can you speak to us? Can you tell us how, first, how you came into Kaizen and then a little bit about what it is? Sure. Well, my, my passion is looking at success behavior. And so the, my research team at UCLA and now here at the University of Washington um, has been collecting studies from around the world that follow people for decades to see who over the course of a lifetime, in spite of adversity and challenges and setbacks, ultimately thrive not just in job, not just in health, not just in relationship, but in all three. And I was reading a newspaper one day and there was a full page ad for the Toyota Lexus. And for the umpteenth year, they were the most highest quality uh, car in the world. And I thought, well, there maybe there's something metaphorically about mm -hmm. building a car that I can apply to helping people build their lives. So I started researching it. And there's a book called The Machine That Changed the World, which you think would be about computers, but it's about cars. And they kept talking about a man named Edward Deming, who um, during World War II had been involved with quality control. So I started reading his work and actually, long story short, got invited to work with him for a week. And one of wow. his main principles, because as, as you know, when we entered World War II, um, your nation and mine, we entered very suddenly with very little human and material resource. Mm -hmm. And so what Deming and his colleagues did is told workers uh, to look for very, very small ways they could try to improve the process or product. And through these small steps, they built some of the highest quality products in the world. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got interested. And then they, they in, 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 introduced it to Japan after the war and small struggling firms like Toyota embraced it. They gave the name for this small step model to a Kaizen, meaning good change. Um, and they call it their soul. So mm. I got very interested in the small steps and began looking. And when I, when I, when I, as I researched it, I found over 600 uh, articles in the business world about how to apply it to manufacturing. And I thought anything that was that powerful in manufacturing must have other applications and began seeing how you could use it in health and even in romance. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that is where I would really love to start because it, for example, for those of you that are watching this right now, I started with Dr. Maurer's work reading the Kaizen way and it starts with health. And can you tell us some of the crazy myths and then stats around health and small steps? Sure. Well, for most of us, when we think about losing weight or uh, doing anything related to health, we tend to think in terms of big steps. We call mm -hmm. it the taking the largest possible steps to accomplish a large goal. So traditionally, we join a gym or we get a fancy piece of, of exercise equipment, trainer, you know, severe diets, all those things. And sometimes it works, but most of the time it doesn't. You look at statistics in the United States and Canada, we're getting heavier and heavier and heavier. Mm -hmm. uh, and Harvard did a study looking at why it is with all the exercise equipment and gyms and information, why we're getting heavier. One of the main contributors they found is because we are, uh, we tell people based on science that you should be exercising 30 minutes a day, five days a week, 
cetera, et cetera. And it, what we're beginning to realize is we've done more harm than good because people think unless they're going to the gym or getting on a very expensive piece of exercise equipment, they're not exercising. Mm -hmm. and what, what the Mayo Clinic was one of the first to discover when they looked at thin people versus heavy people, neither group set foot in the gym, um, is that thin people were simply moving more during the day. These were people who parked at the end of the grocery store a lot and walked. These are people when they were on the escalator would be moving. While they were listening to a, a talk like this, they'd be moving around in their, in their home. Um, they would take the stairs instead of the elevator when possible. They simply move more during the day, which uh, they developed this very fancy pedometer that, that documented this added up to about 350 calories a day, which is a small sandwich. The 350 calories over a, a, a year, a day over a year is 30 to 40 pounds of weight loss. So they found every minute of exercise counts. In fact, sometimes the more you, they looked at a study of joggers, those who didn't jog at all, those who jog one to two miles a week, and those who jog five to seven. And the mild joggers were actually the healthiest. The people who were jogging uh, five to seven hours a week had the same health risk as those who were not jogging at all because too Whoa. much good thing is a problem. And so what we found over and over again, the studies are just now legion that if you can get people to start moving one or two minutes at a time, but doing it every day, eventually you develop a habit. Mm -hmm. can, so, so study after study has found this. So tell me more about this one to two minutes a day, because I know when I read that, my brain said, not enough, not uh -huh. gonna work, just all of the negativity came pouring in. Can yes. you speak to that? Uh, well, sure, and I'll speak to the, because one of the biggest problem in terms of getting people to use the small steps is exactly what you just said, and that's mm -hmm. the negativity. We can talk a little bit more about that because that's something that also has to be addressed besides our cultural belief that big problems, big solutions. Mm -hmm. And again, if uh, sometimes those big solutions work, somebody joins the gym, gets a trainer, gets a pellet and all that stuff, and it works, most of the time, uh, it doesn't. And that's why this is a second strategy. So what we found in this success research is people would try big steps to see if they would work. And if they didn't, they fell back on small steps. Most people, because of that critical voice in their head, won't even allow themselves to small steps. Yeah. So, these, so small steps work in a couple ways. Because again, if you think about it, how, how do we build habits? Usually it's some small steps over time. For example, advertising is the best example. If I draw two golden arches, what do you think about? Oh, McDonald's. Uh, even if you've never set foot in their restaurant, and you can, you can tell me three or four of their products because they've shown you 15 second commercials over and over and over again. Watch an hour of regular TV. They show you the same commercial again and again and again. Mm -hmm. You think it would vary it, but entertaining us is not their mission. It's building the brand into our mind. Repetition is the way you do that. So uh, let me tell you another story by way of illustration. Before I ever met Dr. Uh, Dr. Deming and learned about Kaizen, there was a world famous pain expert at UCLA doing a two night course on cancer pain. At the end of the first night, he said to the group, I'd like you all to go home and meditate for one minute. Well, I thought that was a pretty stupid idea. I waited for the patients to leave and went up to him and as politely as I could pretend, I said, why one minute? It doesn't seem like it's gonna help anybody. He very politely asked me, how old is meditation? I said, thousands of years old. He said, that's correct. There's a very good chance everybody in this room has heard of it before tonight. Those who like the idea have already found a book or a teacher and they're doing it. For the rest of the people in this room, meditation is the worst idea they ever heard of. I'd rather they go home and meditate for one minute than not meditate for 30. They may discover they like it. They may forget to stop, which is what now 20 years of research argues. So if you can get people to start doing something repetitively, doing it once or twice a day, whatever it is, by five, six days a week, eventually the brain develops a habit. We do that with bad habits as well as good ones. The other way Kaizen works is you're programming the brain for the leap you want it to, to make. If I have a room of 100 mm. people and I say, how many of you remember the exact instant when you master driving? Almost nobody does. One or two hands sometimes go up. But if you think about it, when you first learned to drive, you were on an empty road somewhere with a, with a car that was lurching and a parent yelling at you. But you know, at a certain <laughs> point, you're driving down the highway, completely absorbed by the radio or the conversation with your passenger, oblivious to the fact the brain's now making moment-to-moment life-saving decisions with no conscious effort on your part. 
You learned it incrementally, the brain made the leap into mastery on its own. So small steps seems to be the way the brain prefers to learn. In fact, it's hard to think of any complex thing you learned, whether it's tennis, swimming, anything that you learned with, without doing it in very small steps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a couple things that before we move out of health, that I want to talk about fear because I know you talk about that as a huge underpinning. But before we move out of health and something I would love if you could really quickly talk about it to the listeners, because it's it made such a difference for me when I read it was that you talk about you can double your metabolic rate simply by standing up. These are facts that people don't know. Yes, yes. If you go from sitting to standing, you double your, your metabolic rate, go for a short walk, meaning one or two minutes, you again double your metabolic rate. So if you think about it, you know, there's all kinds of research on why standing and moving particularly, because the standing desk by itself doesn't do you that much good if you're just standing there all day. It's the moving every hour just for a minute or two that lowers your cardiac risk. In fact, the Mayo Clinic Cardiology Department found that people who sit most of the day have the same risk for a cardiac death as people who smoke a pack of cigarettes a day. And the reason we think is that if you we, we are basically genetically hunt, hunter-gatherers. Mm -hmm. We've been on the planet roughly a hundred, couple hundred thousand years. Most of it, we were hunter-gatherers moving every day in search of, of fruits and vegetables. Um, we weren't intended to sit. So this isn't about standing all day. Again, that's too much of a good thing. If you get up every hour just for a minute or two, stretch, move a little bit, go up a flight of stairs, you, all that cardiac risk goes away. We're just wow. intended to move more than sit. But again, jogging, marathons, all that stuff, it's the longer, the more you do it, the longer you do it, the more likely you're going to have hip replacements. Mm. Um, the body doesn't need that kind of punishment. That's amazing. So then your recommendation to help people over this, and I know you repeat it quite a lot, was to literally do something you love, stand in front of the TV and just march on the spot. Well, it's particularly useful for people that hate to exercise. You know, it's, it's a really strange thing. If you think about it, when we were kids, what was our favorite part of school? Recess. Recess. We couldn't wait to get out and move our bodies. You couldn't, you wanted to be excused from the dinner table so you go out and play with your friends. Most of us have been, my, just as guilty, have been immobile for so long that moving mm -hmm. seems like punishment. So what you're really trying to do is recover the joy in moving your body. It's there. We've just buried it underneath obligations and responsibilities and being overweight and tired and all the things that grown-ups do. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you can get people to start doing something, because it's just a minute a day while you're watching TV, again, like Dr. Deming or that, that, uh, that doctor at UCLA was saying, you forget to stop. You're building a habit. Whereas if I say, I want you to exercise 30 minutes a day, you've got all kinds of reasons why you don't want to do that. Um, and it's punishing if you haven't done it in a while. Mm -hmm. So what we found is that we can get people to start in small increments um, eventually they develop the habit because like with any habit, even, even, the, even your listeners who, who love to exercise when they first started, they didn't like it. Then they tolerate it. Now they miss it if they don't do it. So you can develop positive habits as easily as you do negative ones, but you have to do it in small steps. Otherwise it takes willpower, self-control, discipline. Um, and the research is huge. There was a study out of the Cooper Institute, very famous research institute in Texas that found if you exercise three minutes a day, 10 times a day, you get most, not all, of the same benefits from one 30 minute. And again, if I, if I ask your listeners to exercise 30 minutes a day, they're gonna say, of course I know that, but who's got time to drive to the gym, change clothes, exercise, shower, put clothes back on and go back to work? No employer would even tolerate that. Mm -hmm. But if I ask you to move in place for three minutes or take a walk up the stairwell for three minutes, these things are much more doable and they don't require willpower, self-control, discipline. Mm -hmm. You try to make the steps so ridiculously small, they don't require much effort on your part. Mm -hmm. but what the brain decides to store is what you use regularly. I don't know about you. I used to know my, my friend's phone numbers by heart because I had to dial them every day. The smartphones, I have no idea what any of my friend's phone numbers are. Yeah, I know my husband's phone number. That's it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and my mom and dad, because I'd be hung up if I didn't. 
<laughs> I hope they're not watching. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they will be. My mom will definitely be watching. So I want to talk about this motivation and and all of those things you talked about because I know in your book you said what there's something underpinning all those and often it's fear. And I found that very interesting. Can you speak yeah. to that? Sure. Uh, for people that um, love to exercise and eat right and all that, what I'm about to say doesn't doesn't apply. But for most of us, the idea of taking big steps can trigger fear. Um, and the fear may be something as obvious as uh, uh, other things are going to fall by the wayside and I won't meet my responsibilities. But sometimes people have deeper fears. For example, I've worked with many people um, who are afraid if they lose, if they lose all the weight, it, it, they're now going to have to go after a romantic partner. Their, their weight's an excuse not to have to go out in the world and, and, and seek, seek romance or, or whatnot. So sometimes people are they're, they're afraid, if they're, they're actually, actually afraid of losing some kind of control if they exercise right and eat right. Um, wow. And so fear, there's off, 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 people often have some kind of fear underneath it that makes it difficult. Or to give you a simple example, I've worked with patients that decide, all right, I'm going to join the gym and lose the weight. They walk into the gym and what do they see? All these bodies oh, of yeah. people who made the same decision they made this morning, only they made it 10 years ago and they have the bodies to show for it. And then, as you were saying earlier, in terms of uh, people being critical, they beat themselves up for what a loser they are. They didn't figure this out 10 years ago. So what do they do? They turn around and go out and get a pizza. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of the times we're afraid of, of what, what we're going to say to ourselves if we start putting ourselves in situations where we, we're, we're going to compare ourselves to others. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, oh. if you already have an anxiety or fear uh, going, and many of us do, the in interesting thing is the moment you put food on your tongue, it takes literally and a one thousandth of a second to get to the fear mechanism in the brain, shuts off your anxiety or fear instantly. The problem is the minute you swallow that potato chip or chocolate chip cookie, go right back to thinking about whatever it is that's troubling you, triggers that fear mechanism again, requiring another, another one. paper chocolate chip cookie. So people sometimes are using their poor health habits as a way of avoiding other fears in their lives. Um, and so if you, if you stop overeating and start exercising, all those fears about your own self-worth or whether your life's gonna turn out the way you want or how you, having to go for a bigger job, whatever the fears are that are driving you, you're using food or alcohol or TV and distractions to try to um, uh, banish those fears. So you're so, using that action as an interrupt on the... So can you, can you talk to us about the science? Because this was also huge. The amygdala, our three brains. Where does the fear come from? Yes. We basically have three brains in our head and they're wired together, although not perfectly. So the bottom of your head around here is the brain stem. We also call it reptilian brain because from the outside, it looks like the entire brain of an alligator. <laughs> and thus it does very useful things. Wakes you up, puts you to sleep, reminds the heart to beat, incredibly handy. Sitting on top of it about the size of your fist is the midbrain, also called mammalian brain because we share that brain in general with all mammals. And it too has very critical functions. It deals with survival and all the reg and reg regulates the body. And then the miracle of being human is wrapped around the midbrain is the cortex. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a, what makes so that the cortex so amazing is not only all the things accomplished, like, like inventing Zoom and having orchestras and all the automobiles, all the phenomenal, and doing ballet, all the phenomenal things human beings are capable of originate in the cortex. The miracle is not only what it accomplished, but its size, literally no bigger than a sheet of newsprint wrapped in this tiny skull and with it we perform miracles. Now in the middle of the midbrain is a place called the amygdala. It's about the size of an almond. And the amygdala is considered the brain of the brain because so much of the brain is in service to it. It teaches what we call in medical school, the four Fs, food or appetite regulation, fight or flight. Remember that term from high school biology? Mm -hmm. and sex. I won't wait for the laugh, I'll keep going. <laughs> the, the fight or flight mechanism is this alarm system in the brain of every mammal, preparing it for opportunity or danger. So if a lion is lying on the savanna and opens up its eye and sees a delicious gazelle 50 yards away, the eye sends the image of the gazelle to the lion's amygdala, preparing the lion's body to pursue this opportunity that rose lunch arrived. 
the gazelle sees the lion's head stand up. It's in the image of the lion to the gazelle's amygdala, preparing the gazelle's body to escape this disaster that's about to befall it. So opportunity and danger trigger the same primitive alarm system in the brain of both bodies, preparing one for opportunity to one for danger. So it's what we call the fear response, because if somebody's threatening you or you get a letter from the tax people saying you owe lots of money or <laughs> any unpleasant thing, it triggers the amygdala. Now, what's made life complicated for us is this is basically a healthy response. So in the mm -hmm. gazelle and the lion, the pupils dilate to let in more information. The eyes begin to tear because the animals are running very fast. The muscles get tense, but not every muscle. The upper neck muscles get tense pulling on the front of the appendages. The low back muscles get tense pulling on the back appendages. The zebra is nibbling on grass. You think it and sees a lion charging it. Do you think the zebra goes, what does mom say to do? <laughs> Obviously not. <laughs> In a heartbeat, the amygdala makes the mouth dry, the tube to the stomach slams shut, gastric secretion stops, the stomach muscles tense. The animal, if you will, loses its appetite. Now, if two zebras are mating in a lion charges, you think one says to the other, what do you think, sweetheart? Is it worth it? Obviously not. The blood supply <laughs> leaves the genitals. The animals, if you will, lose interest. Now, the animal gets rid of excess baggage. What baggage does an animal carry? Just waste product. So the, um, the animal gets rid of excess baggage so it can run faster towards opportunity away from danger. What, animal, what baggage does an animal carry? Just waste products. So the animal gets explosive urination and explosive diarrhea. We call it scared shitless and pissed off. Those are medical terms. Don't get me in trouble here, Anna. <laughs> now, does this list sound vaguely familiar? It's the exact same list we call stress, but it's basically the body's healthy response to a challenge. And so... Uh, um, when, when, you're, when you're deciding, all right, I'm going to lose all this weight, or I'm going to go for a bigger job, or I'm going to see if I can find the person of my dreams, or I'm going to try to make my marriage richer and more, more fulfilling, any challenge triggers the amygdala. It's like every time you cross the street, the amygdala goes on. So then you get to the other side of the street, the amygdala quiet. So the fear mechanism is what keeps us alive. Um, and it's a healthy response. The problem for many of us is that we're, we're, and it's happened in at least the US culture, probably Canada too, is we've banished fear from our conversation. We no longer see it as something normal. The way I, I explain this to audiences, because again, I, I work in a medical clinic where I train physicians who are going through three years of training to become family doctors. Mm. And I, I've spent about half my career following a doctor through a half day of her clinic standing in the corner of the exam room with the patient's permission and giving the doctor feedback on how they operate and began to realize one day when adults come to a physician to talk about emotional pain they use words like stressed anxious depressed nervous tense is that not your experience as well absolutely but in family medicine we see people through the whole life cycle children don't seem to prefer those words have you ever heard a child say they're anxious about the boogeyman of course not um what do they say instead scared or afraid. Mm -hmm. And you ever hear a kid say, boy, am I depressed? My class is going to the zoo on a field trip and I have to go in the hospital for a surgery. What do children say instead of depressed? Talk sad. about being sad. And in the course of your adult life, how many times have you seen an adult start crying and immediately apologize to you? Oh, I'm so sorry. I promised I wasn't going to do this day. You must think I'm such a weakling. Immediately looking around for tissue. You've seen children crying, sobbing, snot dripping down their nose. <laughs> Have you ever seen a child apologize for crying or reach for a no. tissue? So what we found in these success studies is that successful people assume that whenever they're doing something important, fear shows up. Now, what they do with fear is very different than other people. But going back to Kaizen, the beauty of Kaizen is the steps are so ridiculously small, they tend not to trigger the amygdala. The amygdala sleeps through the whole process. So... Um, you don't have, you don't get overwhelmed at the enormity of what you're trying to do. And again, it doesn't take willpower, self-control, discipline, which is a, a limited resource in our brain, which you, I don't know about you, but I find that again, by eight, nine o'clock at night and I'm tired, I'm making food choices that <laughs> I would have made at seven or eight in the morning. Because what willpower is, is, is essentially glucose in the frontal lobes. It's the brain's ability to say, no, nah, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, and you can do that for only a certain amount of time before the, the brain's too tired and you start making poor choices. Mm -hmm. And so if we can make these small steps over time, what you're doing is developing a habit. So you don't have those kind of cravings because you've already learned that um, to, to behave differently. 
so, so it's, it's so simple because uh, uh, it's hard for people to accept it, which is why I wrote, wrote the book. The science is just overwhelming. Yeah. The other reason is, and going back to what you said when we started, and you said it more beautifully than I can, but many of us have a harsh voice in there, our head. And that harsh voice, when we wake up and realize I should I should be healthier, or the doctor says, you got to lose weight, you're going to be diabetic, or somebody says, I don't know if I love you anymore, any challenge in life, or those decade birthdays where you take stock mm. and think, maybe I put my em emphasis in the wrong place. When we wake up to what, what was truly good for us that we've been ignoring, we have, many of us have a harsh voice in our head. And that harsh voice doesn't want small steps. It wants to change yesterday. Today's yes. tolerable. Tomorrow's an eternity away. Now, the way I explain this to audiences, because most people have that harsh voice, but they're not aware of it because it's been there all their lives. They think mm. it's them. The way I demonstrate it is I say, how many of you consider rejections painful? Everybody raises their hand. I say, well, let me convince you that's not possible. So they say, all right. They look at me like you're looking at me. So I say, all right. <laughs> So, so imagine, so I'm, I'm in a class, I'll go up to some so, so a woman sitting in the front row and I'll, I'll say, so suppose I go up to Sally and say, Sally, would you like to go out with me Saturday night? And Sally says, you know, Bob, I'd like to, but I'm flossing on Saturday night. <laughs> That's rejection. That hurts. You got me that? Anna? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now let's see what happened. So I went up to Sally, asked her out. She gave me that lame excuse. As I walked away, which of these two voices do you think came on in my head? Mm -hmm. Door number one. Boy, Bob, am I proud of you. Nice try. That was gutsy. Could have been a little smoother. Next time you'll do better. I am so proud of you for trying. All the time, a choir, a magnificent choir is singing the Hallelujah Chorus from Handel's Messiah because of my willingness to live at risk and pursue my dreams. Door number one as I walked away, or door number two. Boy, did you sound like a jerk. Who wants to go out with you? You're old, you're ugly, you're fat. Nobody likes you anyway. Which is more likely, one or two? Mm, the second one. Two. So where was the pain? And Sally saying no with the conversation in my head walking away. Yeah. And does that voice show up at the best of times or worst of times? Mm. Worst of times, that voice got built into the amygdala in childhood. And as long as the amygdala is quiet, we're going about our day but something doesn't go our way and that voice comes on telling us what a loser we are. And again, that harsh voice isn't interested in small steps. It wants to change yesterday. So it's very hard if you're angry at yourself um, to, to accept the small steps, unless you face the reality, you've already tried the big steps and they haven't worked. So that's quite the dichotomy though, because if the voice that's telling you, you need the big steps is the same spot that's telling you not to take the big steps. That's exactly. your war in your own head. That's an absolutely beautiful way. In fact, I've never heard it expressed so clearly like that before, but that's absolutely, that's absolutely correct. The same voice that's beating you up <sighs> is giving you solutions that will work. <laughs> and that's what makes it so difficult. Again, if you look at human behavior, we're having trouble getting along with each other. The front page of the paper is not pretty. No. And again, our weight keeps going up. I don't, have you been to Disneyland or Disney World? No, it's on my, it's on my list though. Well, there's a, there's a ride called It's a Small World. And the only way you to get on this ride is if you have kids. But it takes you on a barge through a tour. Anyway, they had to, the reason I bring it up is they can't, they had to close the, this ride for a month and reinforce the barges because we've become so heavy, the barges were sinking. Ooh. So with all this information on weight and all the resources and tools we have, We've gotten heavier and heavier. Now, if you look at any graph about the average weight of an American, I don't, I don't have good data about Canada. It's a steady, heavy, 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 heavy heavier. And if, and if you think about it, you go back to 1960, 70, 80, when people were thinner, they didn't have gyms, they didn't have pelotons, they didn't have any of the stuff that we have today to help us. But people simply move more. If you wanted to change one of the three channels on your television set, you had to get up and do it. If you Ugh. pulled into your driveway and wanted to open the garage door, you had to get out and open it. If you no, your to dad move. told the child to, and then I <laughs> exactly. did it. You had to get someone else to do it right. <laughs> if you wanted to mow your lawn, you had to push a lawnmower. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to get your, the, your, your, uh, your luggage from the trunk of the car to the airline, um, you had to carry it. Um, so we were simply moving more in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Nobody was going to gyms. There weren't any. Nobody had trainers. There weren't any. Nobody had fancy exercise equipment. They didn't exist. We simply moved more. 
and it actually works and we can convince ourselves even that one minute because we don't activate the amygdala is what exactly. I believe it says. Exactly. And again, what the brain decides to store are things you use regularly. Again, you, you have no choice. Those golden arches are locked into your head, even though you may have never set foot at and have no intention mm -hmm. of going to McDonald's because of the repetition. So the brain decides to commit things it uses regularly. Otherwise, it doesn't commit cells to it. So what you're really trying to do is to develop a habit. And the best way to do that, if the big steps have failed you, is by doing things regularly enough that it gets to be routine and you Amazing. forget to stop. Oh, okay. I know we're running really short on time, but there was one other thing that I think, especially for people who are shifting and we're working with some pretty high level, you know, executives, business owners, you know, moms, whoever it is. But one of the things I've been noticing, and especially in my conversations with fantastic people like you is that, and my audience is that people are falling out of their changes also because they don't set up their support systems. And mm -hmm. I read in your book and I was so excited about it. You can use Kaizen to set yourself up with relationships, even if you are absolutely phobic about relationships. Can you talk about that briefly? Yes, the people that have, because there's, there's no other way to conquer a fear than through small steps. And what you're trying to do is reprogram the amygdala. So the small steps can be something as simple as using, for example, if, if you want to be able to approach somebody and ask them out, or you want to be able to just go to a party and be social, there's a Kaizen technique called mind sculpture, which is one of my favorites. It's something athletes developed, and we now are using in a Kaizen fashion. What athletes were doing, and to this day do, is they would close their eyes, imagine themselves doing the activity without moving a muscle, and the brain is so stupid, it doesn't know where it is, and it's sending perfect messages to the body. Michael Phelps, the gold medal winner in swimming, the gold medal winner, by his coach's instructions, he spent the first 30 minutes in the morning in bed swimming, not moving a muscle, but closing his eyes and imagining himself doing it. I'm reading this book called Mind Sculpture, sitting on an airplane, 30,000 feet, strapped into an airplane chair, and imagined I was in the gym reaching for the weights and could feel the muscles in my arm get tense and my heart start to race because my brain didn't know I wasn't in the gym and was sending perfect messages to the body. So you practice 10, 15 seconds at a time, three or four times a day, imagining yourself being at a party, asking questions, being cheerful, just, and again, the brain over time, and again, how long it takes varies brain to brain, but the brain's learning, this is what she wants me to do instead. And eventually that becomes, that, that becomes the habit without you ever having to throw yourself into a party where you're terrorized. So there's lots of small ways you can begin to overcome some of those fears. Mm -hmm. Oh, I really love that. And I really love to use an example of smoking as a replacement for personal intimacy. And I don't think people are even aware they're doing it. And I think it's keeping them from some of their bigger shifts and, and successfully yes. implementing them. Yes. Every animal has a built-in response to fear. So when a deer is frightened, it runs away. When a bird's frightened, it flies away. When a mouse is frightened, it burrows. When a lion's frightened, it attacks. And I've asked this question all over the world from Kansas to Kazakhstan. What is a human being supposed to do when they're afraid? And the answer is, and again, people don't look at me blankly until I ask them, if you have small children and they had a nightmare or thunderstorm, what did they do? And the answer is the same everywhere in the world. They ran to my bed. I held them. I said, it's only a nightmare as if that word meant anything to a small child and their daughter or son went back to sleep. The human response to fear is to reach to another person for support. And many people grew up in families where because of their parents' wounds or because the parents were simply not, they weren't parented in the same way. When you went to your parents' bed, it didn't work out very well. And you learn when life got difficult, pull up the drawbridge, fill the moat with water and take care of it yourself. Um, so having to relearn trusting, leaning on other people is a huge, huge challenge for people. So that's why we, see, we suggest doing it in small steps. Um, if you journal, for example, for 10 minutes a day about whatever emotions you had that day, it's amazing how it strengthens your immune system, lowers your heart rate, because um, again, you're starting to practice in small ways, opening up to somebody, even if it's a piece of paper. Oh, that's huge. That's huge. And I know you also talked about, and it seemed at the time I was, I was thinking this is genius, but you said, make a phone call, even if it's just to yourself, leave it on your voicemail 
I am doing this or I need this to mm-hmm. get used to saying it out loud. Yes, and it's amazing how frightening that can be for people. So I'll have some of my um, clients who I'm work, work, working with just send, send me an email or just write, or write out what they would say to an ideal nurturing person if that person was in their life. So they're just beginning to think about what it would be like if I could trust another person. Oh, oh, oh I love this. I, I, I know that we're almost out of time, but can we, and I know I said this five minutes ago, but I can keep, can I keep you five more minutes? Of course you can. Oh, it's yes. Okay. Talking with you. Oh, this, well, there's, there's so much here. I probably have you on seven segments, but so <laughs> let's, can we drill into this because little questions was a big thing. And I know there are yes. loads of books on questions, but yes. in the Kaizen methodology, I love the way you structure your questions. Can you talk about that? Cause that helps with this part too. Sure. Because sometimes you work with people who think, I don't, I don't know what I want to do with my life. I don't know what I should do next. Um, then one of the weird things about the brain that nobody's been able to figure out is the brain cannot reject a question. Any question you ask repeatedly, the brain's compelled to pay attention to. Um, nobody knows why. The way I demonstrate this, if I'm doing, say, a five-day class in a hotel, is I'll say to the group on day one, what color car was parked two cars to the right of yours in the parking lot? And they looked at each other like, where'd they find this guy? It's the dumbest question anyone's ever asked me. I ask him that same stupid question on Tuesday, by Wednesday at the earliest, Thursday at the latest, pulling into the hotel lot with far more important things on their mind. A place in the brain called the hippocampus will say to them, that fool is going to ask you again about the color of the car, and you're forced to store an answer in short-term memory. So any question you ask repeatedly, particularly if it's gentle, if you say things like, what's wrong with me? Why am I such a loser? How come I can't lose weight? Unfortunately, we ask those questions often enough, the brain decides this must be important, starts collecting columns of cells with every flaw, weakness, and mistake. So when you ask for the umpteen time, why am I such a loser? The brain says, when you were 11, you were rude to your grandmother. When you were 14, you shoplift, has all this garbage stored. Good news is you change the question, you change what the brain stores. So if you can go through the, for example, if you're trying to figure out what you want to do with your life vocationally, you're just stuck, but you have no idea. And there's a lot of people like that, because if you grew up in families where your parents didn't ask you questions like, how was school today? Do you like your new teacher? You don't, how come? I noticed Sally hasn't been coming over. Are you two still friends? If you grew up without those questions, then you don't know how to go inside and find what seem like simple answers to simple questions. So you have to kind of relearn that. Um, And so if you ask yourself a question like, what would be one thing I could do with my life that would be joyful? Or what could I do today that would give me pleasure? Just ask the question once or twice a day. You don't have to come up with an answer. If the question is gentle and repetitive, eventually the body decides this must be important and starts to give you access to it. So you can work on self-esteem by saying, what's one thing I could love about myself? Again, you may get silence for the first week while you're doing it. Eventually, the brain's like that kid in the front row going, I know, I know, and starts popping out answers. Because again, the brain's a creature of habit. That's the bad news and the good news. Mm. So you change the questions you ask yourself to change what the brain stores, changes brain chemistry, and gives you access to a rich inner life that you otherwise wouldn't have. You know, this is fascinating because they have, and there's all sorts of research done on positive self-talk, but I almost wonder if this is like the hyperdrive version because you add the propensity, our need to answer a question with the question that's almost like the self-talk. Why am I great? Why am I that those positive affirmations right. but in the form of a question? I wonder if that's a recipe for just explosive potential. Yes. Questions are one way. There's another Kaizen technique to work on self-esteem because the way we define self-esteem now is what you say to yourself when things aren't going well. Mm. Any fool can like themselves when everything's going right. But when you have a setback or an adversity, is the voice in your head, that nurturing voice, that tabernacle, that voice of the hallelujah chorus, or is the voice harsh and mean, which just makes things worse. Mm. So there's a simple way to reprogram it. um, And that is, Uh, And if you want, I can demonstrate it. What you do is you start to imagine, all right, in this situation, whatever it is, I'm frustrated with my marriage or my work, or I'm I'm overweight and don't like it, and I'm beating myself up. What's the voice I want to have show up? And you practice that voice 
preferably out loud, because every time you talk, the amygdala goes on. You're trying to build new learning into an old brain. So even though you can get the idea in your head, to get it into the midbrain requires repetition and practice. Mm. So here, let me demonstrate. Here's the, vo here's the <clears throat> negative voice. You don't have to practice that. For most of us, it's mm. well practiced. Um, so here's, I'll just do the negative voice for contrast. I have this really tough job. I work in this small building in Santa Monica. We provide care for many poor people that come in with so many social, economic, psychological problems we can do nothing to help with. And these are young doctors learning their craft, sometimes making mistakes, sometimes serious ones as they practice their craft. And a bunch of faculty, mostly strong-willed physicians who think everybody should do things their way. All right, what's the voice I want to have show up on the difficult days in, in my work life? I have this amazing opportunity. I work in this small building in Santa Monica where we provide care for many poor people. Otherwise, we get no health care at all. A group of young physicians training for one of the noblest branches of medicine, family practice, a group of faculty who could double their income doing anything else in healthcare but are committed to teaching. If we can provide a quality experience for these patients, we can train these young doctors not only to be competent but compassionate. We can learn to get along with each other as a faculty will be a beacon to the world. Now, the only chance that second voice has of showing up is practice. The brain doesn't care in the same way that you speak English, because it's incredibly useful in Canada. If we fly you to Germany, six months from now you're speaking German, a year from now you're dreaming in it. The brain doesn't care. It would prefer the language be useful when it comes to ordering lunch. Mm -hmm. so the brain doesn't have any attachment to this harsh voice. Most people don't even know it's there. Remember a few minutes ago, you thought that harsh voice was in Sally, not in here. Mm -hmm. Once you know it's there, then the question is, how do I reprogram it? It takes repetition, but it's not hard to do. So you think, all right, what would I say to a loved one, to my, a child, to a key employee, if they were in the same situation, practice it out loud in the tone of voice you want, because all the emotions live in the midbrain, mm -hmm. language with the cortex, and you're trying to build it into both brains. Mm -hmm. So you're talking to the guard at the gate, basically. You're making friends with him. You say these things so articulately. I'm going to steal these lines from the next book. It's 100%. Really <laughs> I would love to be a quote in one of your books. That would that would be next level. See my Already positive have. voice is going off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is a guardian at at the gate because unless you can get past that harsh voice, there's no peace in his life. Oh, and I love I love Kaizen. And for those of you that are watching this and you are resonating heavily, which is going to be just about my entire audience, if not my whole audience. Robert or Bob, how do they find you? How do they get your work. I, I've dropped some links in the boxes below along with oh, thank you. all of the contact info. So guys, click those links. You can buy the books, you can visit the site, but can you tell us a little bit more about some of the stuff that you do with your work, where, where they can find you? Sure. The simplest way to find me is through the website, scienceofexcellence.com. So there's three books, two on Kaizen, one about how to apply it to your personal life, one about applying it in the work setting. And then a book, uh, my most recent book is called Mastering Fear which is about the whole issue of fear and reaching for support. So those are the three books that are available through Amazon or through the website. Um, I go around the world doing seminars and workshops and love to come to Canada. Oh, oh, if you're in, let me know, please email me. I am 100% there. I might try to steal some of your time for another interview. You know, oh, I would, I'd, I'd be honored. <laughs> it's great talking with you. Oh, that's amazing. All right, guys, you heard it here first. Kais, the Kaizen way, that's where I started. I will be reading your book on fear next, which I believe is, I have it up here on the screen. Mastering fear, harnessing emotion to achieve excellence in work, health and relationships. Next on my reading list, you guys will see a review here as well. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, I have had such a wonderful conversation with you. It's truly an honor, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.